Good morning, boss. Welcome to Sunday morning worship. I hope you guys are ready. I hope you had an amazing week. Um, I hope that you are just um, excited about being in the presence of the Lord. One more time, uh, as the old folks used to say, um, we are getting ready to go into worship. So uh, we have our sister, our very own Bostonian Leslie Allen, that's going to be leading us on this morning. Um, she has a very special worship. So get ready for a special time. Have a seat. Get ready to um, just get uh, get into the presence of the Lord in a different way. Allow him to speak to you. Allow him to enter thoughts into your mind and you just ride the wave uh, that is the worship of Leslie Allen and then also enjoy uh, the service this morning the preaching of the word hope you guys enjoy dive in dive in have a good one so while the world is going through transformative things I've been wanting to trans uh, focus on the transformation of my mind and I never forget the day when it first started getting good information because things happen to us when we hear truth and it changes things so the first time I heard truth was when I read Psalm 23 at the age of 45 and my whole life started changing then it was great and so the way I heard it that day sounds like this <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he guides me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me when I. For me, where in the presence of my enemy, oh yeah, and you anoint my head with oil. Yeah. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day. of the Lord forever and I'll never forget that day because that was the day I learned how to play guitar to words that were already written and I learned how to sing at the same time of playing so that was a miracle in itself but the best part of it was hearing the truth for the first time that God makes us for good things. And so when you start learning the truth about God, what he has to tell us, what he has to teach us, how he loves us, I was comfortable enough to learn the truth about myself. Sitting at the table, what do I need? Need to be able to sing what I see. Of the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth in me. The truth, the truth, the truth, yeah, is the truth. That's what I need. Not blessed with friends or family, abundantly. I'm just a humble vessel, sharing my testimony. Every time I try to take my life Before I fell too far 
He came down and saved my life Last time with his guitar For the truth, the truth, the truth The truth of me The truth, the truth, the truth, yes It's the truth that set me free When folk don't understand me Or can't perceive The Holy Spirit helped me Share what I need So sitting at that table What do I need? I need to be able here yeah, Sing what I see Of the truth, the truth, the truth The truth is what I need The truth, the truth, the truth, yes It's the truth that sets us free The truth, the truth, the truth, yeah The truth for you and me The truth, the truth, the truth, yeah It's the truth that sets us free Peace and blessings, Boss Church. Good morning, Boss. So grateful to be with you guys again here in our eCampus space. Thank God for another day, another week that he's allowed us to see. Praying for so many of you. I know so many of you are going through tremendous transition and things are somewhat better for some, but for many, things are still difficult. So we are praying for you, those that have experienced loss in their family, we are praying for you uh, and those that are struggling financially. We are praying for you um, on today as we continue in our conversation, our hit list of sorts and what we're killing as we go into 2021. Uh, we prepare for a fast. We're preparing for a fast. Those of you that have not yet found out, check out the website on their uh, fast 28 day fast on the website. We are fasting for the entire month of February before you panic you can choose your fast. Now, fasting, you all, is sacrifice. So it is giving up something that would be sacrificial, something that you love, something that you like, something that you tend to do a lot uh, that you can give up in order to spend more time in prayer, more time in study, and loving and worshiping the Lord. If you have not had an opportunity yet, uh, check out our, our uh, moments this week on all of our places where we've talked about in our devotional uh, why fasting is important, what fasting does. Because to kill stuff, to handle some things, to deal with some things, we have to have extra strength from the Lord. On today, you guys, we are continuing in this conversation and drawing kind of to a, not a close, but a transition um, in this conversation on killing things in this hit list that we have. Um, the hit list today is going to be very, eh, not heavy, but I, I do want us to process and listen with open ears and open hearts and spirits and be very self-reflective and kind of look internally to kind of ask and gauge where we really are and ask ourselves some hard questions. So today is going to be very much more conversational. Uh, we're not going to be uh, preaching, teaching long this morning. Just want to walk you through some things and kind of have you ponder. So if you will, grab pen and paper, uh, your Bible, whatever you need and we gonna get right into it, all right? So as you do that, we again, we ask that if you have not participated fully in worship this morning, uh, that in this moment that you would pause things, that you would sit down, settle yourself, settle your spirit, so that you may hear what the Holy Spirit has to reveal to you today. So with all that said, let's pray, let's pray. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you that your word does not return void, but it does what you send for it to do. We pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would preach, that you would teach, that you would declare your word to us now that we may forever be changed. We thank you now that you are the life giver. And we pray now, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would guide us in our conversation today as you speak to us, about us, concerning us, and for us, that we may be the people that you've called us to be. We glorify you now for every prayer request that is set before you. We know that you hear all things, and we pray now that you would do according to your will for every life and every situation. 
uh, connected to the request we put before you. We glorify you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today, you guys, let's let's jump right into it. Those of y'all taking notes, you can write down the name of this person, this thing on the hit list. Today, we are killing hate. Today, we're killing hate. H-A-T-E. We are killing hate. Now, very quickly, in our conversation and dialogue, you may find things that correlate to events and things that we've experienced over the last year. However, this conversation is not really about that. Um, we are fully aware that hatred exists in our country. We're fully aware that racism is alive and well. Uh, you cannot deny it. Um, not saying every response to it has been proper, but the fact of the matter is it exists. It is alive. It is here. Um, and racism is rooted a lot in a hatred for the other. But the conversation I want to have today is kind of dialogue about hate. What, what is it? Where does it come from? Um, what does it do? All right. And so I want to look at two verses of scripture, two verses, um, and we will kind of deal with the context of them a little bit. But I want to pull some things out of these two verses. The first one I want you guys to look at is 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 15, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 15. And when you get it, put something there, put something there. We're going to come back to and read that one first, but I want you to have the other one ready and then we can just go to when we, and when it's time. So first one is 2 Samuel. Chapter 13, verse 15, put something there. The next verse we're going to go to is Judges 14 and 16. Judges 14 and 16. All right. Judges 14 and 16. When you get to Judges 14, 16, put your finger there, put a piece of paper there, and we're going to read 2 Samuel 13 and 15. And then we're going to jump back and read Judges 14 and 16. All right. Second Samuel 13, 15 says this. Flip back to it. If you're not there yet, flip back to it. it says this. Then I'm reading from the Amplified. Then Amnon became extremely hateful toward her for his hatred toward her was greater than the love which he had for her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. Read it one more time. Then Amnon became extremely hateful toward her, for his hatred toward her was greater than the love which he had for her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. Now flip back over to Judges, Judges chapter 14, Judges chapter 14, verse 16. It says this, so Samson's wife wept before him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. You have asked my countrymen a riddle and have not told the answer even to me. He said to her, listen, I've not told my mother or my father either. Why should I tell you? First part of that one more time. So Samson's wife wept before him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. Uh, hate you guys. Hate you all. It's a very interesting thing. These two texts, though not connected really at all, uh, they highlight some things about hate that we see in relationship one with another. Anybody who's been alive any amount of time, you have probably at some point in your life encountered hate, whether you have hated someone else or someone else has hated you. Now, I'm not talking about in the way we kind of joke, you know, I got haters, people hating on you and all that stuff. Most times, that ain't even true. Ain't nobody hating on you. You just think they hating on you. Oh, ain't nobody hating on you. Um, that's not the hate I'm talking about. I'm talking about that intense feeling of disdain that you can have toward another person and another person can have towards you. Um, but watch this, that sometimes we even have toward ourselves. What is the genesis, the beginning? What is the starting point of that? Many of us watching this right now, in 2020, you have realized there are some people and some things that you deeply hate. 
and not to try to throw the word around a lot, but we do in America and is in, in the English language, we have trivialized it almost like we have the word love. They have almost lost the impact of their meaning because we use both so greatly. We use them to cover such wide ranging things, some things as trivial as uh, I love chicken, I hate broccoli, uh, I love uh, candy, I hate spinach, you know, and we trivialize it to such a degree that it becomes easier to use the words. When the truth of the matter is we feel these passions, we feel these things, and we have many of us have experienced giving and the receiving. So the question becomes, what is the genesis of? What is the start of this hate? What is the thing that causes us to deeply hate ourselves? Let's start with looking at hate from this angle. Hate, you all, can be described or defined as, uh, I did a census with some of my deep thinking brothers and sisters, and the overall uh, thought was that hate is a basic devaluing of something or someone. Again, at its base level, it is a devaluing of something and someone to the extreme, watch this, that you will actively seek to enforce, reinforce that devaluation. So it, it, it is, you look at, let's use a, a building or a property, so to speak. Uh, if you look at a building and you hate the building, you actively determine that this building is not the same value as a building that you like. To such a degree, what hate is, it is now that it has driven you to actively in your behavior bring about the reality of what you already feel. So what does that mean? That means now you go and you abuse the building. You damage the building. You treat it as lesser, and because you treat it as lesser, you never care for it properly, so it eventually becomes worth what you already deemed it worth. Y'all with me so far? Hate, you all, is when that passion in us, that, that feeling, that urge, that strong thing in us, looks at a person or a thing and determines it is not worth the stated value, intended value, or the proclaimed value. It, it is less than. The question becomes, what makes us devalue somebody? What makes us devalue a thing? Uh, I would suggest that one of the things we talked about when we first started this conversation on killing things is that that comes from a moment, it comes from an experience. Many of us, you have an experience, and that experience causes you to have a traumatic engagement with something or someone. That experience alone, that engagement, watch this, that you felt devalued, you, now causes you to return the same evaluation to the object that put it on you in the first place. What does that mean? somebody you dated, somebody you hung out with, somebody uh, that you've been around that treated you a particular way in a moment. In that moment, you felt the disdain. You felt like they treated you as nothing. You felt like they overlooked you. And so now in you, there's this feeling, right? And the feeling begins to grow and your mind begins to attach thoughts to the feeling. You ruminate on it. You sit and you think about it. How dare they? How could they? Why would they? Uh, now, here's the thing. At some point in the thinking on the feeling, you start to ask yourself, what's wrong with me? And when you start asking yourself, what's wrong with you? You get upset at yourself for looking at yourself as less than. Now, this turns back into how dare they make me feel this way about myself? And so now this continues to grow. And so now something in you says, I'm not less than, they are less than. I, I hate you for what you've done to me. I hate you for how you've made me feel. I hate this thing. I hate this system. And all of it revolves around you all. Watch this. This belief that a thing or a person has caused us harm to such a degree, watch this, that we end up living in a place of fear. It is, it is the 
fear of what could happen that is similar to the last time you felt devalued. And that fear begins to project on the person or the thing uh, that you feel like may cause this harm. And so you begin to hate, you begin to dislike, you begin to have disdain, you begin to lower the value of them. Hate, 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 hate. Hate, you all, is the result of offense and rejection. When we have been offended, when we have been rejected, hate grows out of that place. Now, here's the crazy thing. What fuels it? What keeps hate going? Let's be clear. Hate is not simply you don't like. Hate is a passionate, uh, mind-numbing, overtaking of your will type of emotion. It is, it is when you have such a disdain, such a dis devaluing of somebody that it overtakes how you think. If you if you ever bust a U-turn in the middle of a street because you thought you saw so and so go past and you've been waiting to give them a piece of your mind and you bust a U-bird in the middle of the street, uh, you you might have some hate going on. If if you've ever gone through leaps and bounds to make someone feel how you feel, you might have some hate going on. Uh, if, if you if you go through extreme lengths, go to extreme lengths in order to make somebody uh, understand how they made you feel or you want them to hear how you feel and you will go through all kind of lengths and degrees, watch this, to make them hurt, then you probably or probably are dealing with hate. Hate you all is dangerous because not just the emotional side of it, not just the mental side of it, because mentally it can drain. Mentally it can pull you. It can pull the same way we feel energized by love. Oh my God, butterflies and you're in love and everything is sunshine. And it can be a hurricane outside and you are just like, oh, it's so beautiful outside. Uh, you have that feeling. Hate does the opposite. It can drain joy out of anything. It can drain smiles and laughter from any place. It can be such a weight and a burden that it physically tires you out. And so we begin to walk in this space, but hate is not self-sustaining. Hate is not self-sustaining. What happens with hate is hate is fueled, is continued by a false narrative. Stay with me a false narrative. This false narrative adds to the fear and the fear adds to the hate. The false narrative being that this thing or this person is a threat to my value. This thing, this person is a threat to my value. And that can even be ourselves. It can be us looking in mirrors in the morning, hating what we see to the, such a degree that there are many men and many women who take hours to prepare to leave the house because they hate who they are as a person in their natural skin, that they will spend hours disguising themselves to fit a narrative that makes them feel safe about how they look to the world. Because again, the hate that they feel towards themselves is now being projected and they are receiving what they think is hate from others. And they say, if I think I look like, as surely they think I look like this. If the, the Bible talks about when they sent spies into the land to spy the land for milk and honey um, to the promised land, they went and they came back and they gave a report and said, uh, there are giants in the land. And the Bible says that they saw themselves as grasshoppers, so they must be grasshoppers to the giants. And what that means is how you see yourself determines how you view other people and how you think other people view you. Now, what this has to do with hate is that now you and I begin to morph and force ourselves to become people that we are not in order to push back against those that we think are devaluing us. It's a fear. It's a fear that somebody's gonna harm me. It's a fear that somebody's gonna take something from me. And that starts in these experiences and these moments that trauma has set in, where you've gone through terrible breakups, you've gone through terrible divorces, you've gone through terrible job loss, you've gone through 
houses being lost and cars being repossessed and all these experiences you've gone. Some of you have gone through moments where you've had daughters have had fathers call them ugly to their face. You've had sons hear over their mothers say, I never wanted you. These, these things begin to sit in us. And so now you have a man, thank you, Holy Spirit, who has been told by his mother, I never wanted you. And so now everybody's trying to figure out why he hates women. And you know, he hates women because every woman he's with, he abuses. Every woman he's with, he puts down. Every woman he's with, he treats a certain way as though she's property. Watch this. The hate now is fueled by the narrative that no one wants me. And before you get rid of me because you don't value me, I am going to devalue you by abuse, by destruction, by tearing you down because I hate you. But why do you hate me? I hate you because you devalue me. I hate you because you're going to give me away like my mother gave me away. I hate you because you are discarding me like every other man has ever discarded me in my life. And it started with daddy saying to some four-year-old daughter of his, uh, you ugly, you're not this. So now that woman spends life uh, doctoring up her body, her physicality to impress and entice men to draw them in so that that she can control the situation because otherwise she knows they're going to do something else to her. It's a, it's a hate. It's a, it's a, I hate the way I look. I hate my hair. I hate these, uh, the way my skin looks. I hate my acne. I hate my weight. I hate my hips. And we start hating all these things, but because the word is so casually used, we don't realize how much our behavior is following the words. And here it is. You see in these two verses, we looked at a very interesting thing play out. In 2 Samuel, it says, Amnon became extremely hateful toward her, for his hatred toward her was greater than the love he had for her. In the 2 Samuel text, that story is very traumatizing and it would definitely be a trigger warning for anybody that's gone through any type of abuse in an intimate relationship um, before you just read that. It, it is a very profound and terrible example of one of the things humans struggle with when it comes to hate. There was a movie came out um, years ago, Martin Lawrence. Martin Lawrence in, in the movie's called Thin Lines, the thin line between love and hate. Uh, I would venture to say there is not really a thin line between love and hate. What we confuse is that it's, it's really just a thin line between two opposite extremes of passion. Two opposite extremes of passion. It is not love on the other side of that equation. On the other side of that line is not love. It is just another aggressive, codependent, dysfunctional passion. Many people that say they love someone don't love someone, watch this, is that their hate uh, either of themselves or this person that represents a figure in their past has now latched on to with passion as a leech, something that it can drain to soothe or be the pacifier of this burning hatred that is passionate with inside of them. Stay with me for a second. Some of you have been with folk that you don't love. You just passionately hate them in such a way and the passion is pleasing. Mm. The passion has been sexually driven and it's great and your body loves it, but at the root of it, there is a disdain and a devaluing of the other. Uh, you have held on to them because you don't value them. You have held on to these things because you don't value yourself. And so we end up grabbing. The Bible says he now hated her. Same level with which he loved her. Because in this moment, watch what happens is he's gotten what he wanted. The lust of the moment has been fulfilled. And now all facades fall away. Many times you all, hate is hiding behind the facade of love and commitment. Hate is hiding behind this facade of passion. 
really, if you listen to a lot of our songs, they serve one purpose. There's one goal, and that is to obtain somebody. Obtain somebody or somebody's body. And it is not to love them. It is not to care for them. It is not to hold them close. It is, I need you to provide, watch this, a soothing moment. I need you to pacify this anger that wells in me. Many people in our country right now that run around using the word hate and I hate this, I hate Democrats, I hate Republicans, I hate black people, I hate white people, everybody, everybody hating everything. Now, it, it's really not that we hate Democrats or we hate Republicans or we hate, we hate the fact that, not, that these things are not soothing us anymore. We hate when the rug is pulled from under us. We hate when now you are no longer doing what I wanted you to do, needed you to do. And so now my disdain for you grows because I knew you would do this. He, he, here, here it is. He's, he's, he hates her now because she served his pur her purpose. Many times, you all, we have to be careful when it comes to hate, when it comes to living on these narratives that have told us that this is a danger to you. Many of us hate, hear this, thank you, Holy Spirit, because we have not learned to love in a healthy way. Most of us have grown up in dysfunctional situations where passion was confused for love. And when passion is confused for love, you can accept being devalued when a person passionately devalues you. But watch this. The problem with that is at some point that thing runs out. And when it runs out, you now have reinforced the narrative that they hate me and therefore I hate myself. You reinforce the narrative when this thing runs out that they don't value me. Therefore, I don't value myself. And therefore, because they don't value me and now I don't value myself and they've made me not value myself, I don't value you. This, this, is, this is the essence of the hatred that begins to grow. Then you have in uh, the next verse in Judges, says Samson's wife wept before him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. Now, peep this. One verse, 2 Samuel, we see a man who has manipulated, torn down this woman. And he's doing so based on how he feels. He, he, he genuinely has disdain for her now because she served the purpose, right? But then in another text that we just read, in Judges, this woman now, is manipulating this man. Let me tell y'all something real quick. Be real, real clear. Let me go ahead and say this, all y'all deep spiritual Pentecostal folk. Uh, uh, Jezebel is not a female spirit. Jezebel is not just connected to women. It is a spirit that is manipulative. Watch this. That, le that lives with, hangs out with same realm as those spirits that cause us to devalue or hate one another. Because now this woman says to him here in uh, Judges, Samson and Gator's riddle out, uh, made a huge bet in Vegas uh, with the folk in Vegas and said, hey, you know, if y'all can guess this thing, you know, I'll give you, you know, two Lamborghinis, a Bentley and a mansion. Um, he's marrying this, you know, this, this sister from Vegas. And, you know, he's there hanging out. They're at the party. They're hanging. They're kicking it. And can't nobody figure out the riddle he didn't put out there. They don't know what he's talking about. So they go to home girl. I'm like, look, man, you from the block. You with us. You supposed to be with us. Like you brought this dude around. This new dude. We don't even really know this dude. He already annoying, getting on our nerves. He didn't get his riddle. Come on now, you got the inside track. Tell us what what what's the answer so we can you know we can you know make some money real quick. But she doesn't know the answer. Now watch this. What does her not having that information do? When it's pointed out to her, she doesn't have the information. Let me say that slow so y'all get it. She already knew she didn't know the answer because he hadn't told her the answer. She knows the riddle is out there. She knows he's presented it. 
The Bible doesn't say, and I'm not going to assume, but based on the text, there's no indication that she is bugging him for the answer at this point. She probably, y'all, doesn't care that she doesn't know the answer because this don't have nothing to do with her. Now, uh, now some of some sisters, some people can just be nosy. They just naturally nosy, and some, you know, some of y'all just be like, "Well, don't you think what's what's the answer?" Uh, but for the most part, she's planning a wedding. She's looking for a dress. She's trying to get life together. She didn't came up. Samson's a good catch. She ain't thinking about this little silly riddle he got with her cousins and her uncles and them, right? But when they say to her, "How don't you know?" Let me, let me put that in more present day language. You know, if he really loved you, how, why he ain't telling you this? Why he keeping secrets from you? Watch this, watch, watch, watch how it plays out. He don't really love you. You must not really mean nothing to him. So now, what does that narrative do? I mean, hear me out. Oftentimes the enemy will present a narrative to us in a moment. That is something we ain't even thought about before. And now you latch on to it and you know the enemy is planting a seed to cause you to begin to hate because now you are questioning your value based upon something you were asked, something you heard, something you saw that before that moment you care nothing about. You ain't thought nothing about them shoes that, you know, you bought your wife back in 82. You, you ain't thought nothing about them doggone things until one of your guys, or, oh, thank you, here's a better one, or a sister girl at your job that got kind of like you anyway and got a crush on you and don't want you to stay with your wife anyway, and she kind of say, didn't you buy her some shoes? All you, you know, if you bought me some shoes, I would wear them all the time because I just love your taste in shoes. You are such a connoisseur of shoes. I mean, oh my God, them shoes you bought her were amazing. I can't believe I never see her on Instagram with those shoes on. And now in your head, you are now beginning to question how much she values you. To the point, watch this, that's just the seed. And the enemy keeps feeding that narrative, feeding that narrative. To one day, you're in an argument, you all in an argument, and suddenly somebody yells out, I hate you. And can't nobody figure out where that came from. It's because a question is asked strategically, a narrative is placed strategically, something it's a place you once loved your church. You once loved serving in a particular place. You once loved your job. And then one day somebody asked the right question at the right time. And now you're wondering how much they value you. And that seed continues to grow until you say, "I, you know what? I don't need y'all. And that can, begins to grow. And so now she, she sits with Samson. She says, yo, man, you hate me. You don't love me. Now, I don't know about you, brothers, but me, I'd have been like, yo, what? Like, that's a bit dramatic. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, dude? I hate you. Yeah. Uh, I just married you. What are you talking about? I hate you. I just, you know, came to town to get you. So you hate me. You can't possibly love me. Watch this. Because you withhold from me. Because you withhold from me. I am scared that if you withhold this, you'll withhold something else that is a danger to my sanity, my safety, my emotional peace. If you withhold this, what else can you withhold? If you withhold from me, then you must not value me because you don't trust me. If you don't trust me, you can't value me. If you don't value me, you can't trust me. There's this whole thing that's probably going on in her head. And now she lays this at Samson's feet. You hate me. Many of us struggle with hate simply because you have questioned your value based upon the fear of others withholding from you. Some of us, some of us, here, yeah, push it a little bit further, let's push it a little bit further. Some of us struggle not to hate God. Actually, let me go further. Some of us hate God. We just don't use the words. And that's because we feel like he's withholding. And you're only, you only can be withholding God because you don't value me. You can only be withholding because I don't matter. One of the arguments, one of the fights with race in this nation, and the reason many African-Americans, black folk are 
heated, upset. And you may hear some black men, some black women say, they, I hate white people. I hate this government. I hate this system. It is because they lived in places where things have been withheld. And when something is withheld, the conclusion has to be, watch this, not just withheld, but it's shared other places. You know, if you withhold from me, you must not value me. And if you devalue me, it makes me feel fearful of what else you can do, what else you will do when I don't matter. What happens, you all, is we get into a nasty cycle because it creates a self-hate where we start looking at ourselves particular ways. It, it shifts us. This, this idea that there is a threat to our life, there's a threat to our sanity. And so now we are pushing back and hatred begins to well because how dare you? How, how dare you treat me like this? It Hate you all becomes this boomerang of sorts, boomerang of sorts. It is, it is, how can I, um, how can we put it? it? It's, it's the moment fear takes hold that I'm being devalued. All right. I'm not worth anything. And now it is projected forward. Everything you look at going forward, you walk into with this concern, this idea that I'm about to be devalued. And before you can devalue me, I need to devalue you. And so now this boomerang begins to come back. It's gone out as fear. It's gone out as hesitation. It's gone out as caution. It's gone out as nervousness. It's gone out as all these things. But now it's coming back as a hatred. It's come back with this anger. It comes back with this passionate, uh, uh, active uh, force to devalue the other before they can devalue me. I hate you for what you've done to me. And many times, sometimes people haven't even done anything yet. Because something has happened. Let me say that. Let me say that for those of you that struggle with anything that you've heard this morning in terms of you realize, man, I might hate some people. I might hate some stuff. I might hate myself. How, what do I, what? I must be a bad person. I must be evil. Yes, there are spirits behind it. Yes, uh, a lot of activities demonically driven. Yes, there's behaviors that we need to really deal with and rein in. Um, but the first thing you need to realize is that the enemy strategically placed an event or a person in some part of the timeline of your life to bring this feeling, this emotion, this thing about. And to move forward in your life in a healthy way, you have to, we have to kill hate. You have to kill hating other folk. And I'm not, now hear me, hear me. That doesn't mean we become kumbaya, right? That doesn't even mean we become friends. I may still just not like you. <laughs> I don't, I, but I don't have to actively seek to devalue you because I don't like you. It just means I ain't got to hang out with you. It just means I ain't got to talk to you. We ain't got to text. You go about your life. I go. But hatred drives you to actively seek to devalue somebody, whether by your actions or by your words. So we have to kill it because the essence of who the church is called to be is the antithesis of hatred. And I don't mean necessarily love per se, but it is just genuine concern for the other. I cannot like you, but still want you to win. I cannot like you, but still want you to be who God has called you to be. Why? Because God loved you. And if God can love you, I mean, the Bible says very clearly, how can we say we love God that we can't see, but hate our brother that we do see? Again, I'm not talking about kumbaya. I'm not talking about we all about campfires holding hands. I'm not talking about some joker broke your heart. I'm not talking about some sister left you broke and took all the stuff or is playing games with the kids. And now you're supposed to go out and shake hands and take them shopping and have lunch and dinner together. I ain't saying, no, I, I, what I'm saying is you release the passionate, active devaluing of the other and yourself from your mind and your heart and your spirit so that you are free to move forward in your life because watch this, 
as we begin to transition to the next thing, everything that I've named this month that Pastor Margo's talked about that we are killing, they are anchors. They're anchors. You and I are ships in the middle of the sea, middle of the rivers, and you wonder why you haven't moved. Because each of these things, despair and anger and fear and uh, they are anchors and you are stuck by the shores of your first trauma because you don't cut the cord to the anchors you can't love nobody and hate yourself you cannot love a spouse a girlfriend a boyfriend a your kids and hate is active in your spirit because I tell you this if you don't kill it that devaluing will spread and it will spread in such ways that you won't even notice until it's impacted those that you've devalued you got to kill it so pastor how do we kill hate what do, what do we what do we do? How do we how do we kill it? Uh, fasting. Prayer. Watch this. And releasing some people and some things and some experiences. It's a mill. You can Google this. I ain't got to give, spell it out for you. You can Google release activities. There's stuff where you write letters out to folk and never mail it. There's stuff where you put stuff on paper and you burn it. I mean, it's it's a it's a gang of stuff. Put it in balloons with helium, let it float away. Whatever you want to do. Uh, if if it's you know Angela uh, Bassett and uh, what's that movie that the girl was in uh, when she burned old boy stuff in the car? She burned the car and all that stuff. Uh, uh, waiting to exhale when she was exhaling. You know now 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 now. This is like if the person has moved out, they gone, gone. Everything's gone, gone. Like they not coming back. Just then, you know, you need to need to burn her clothes. Burn her clothes in the backyard. Burn them in the bathtub. Whatever. whatever. Release it. Let them go. Because as long as you are anchored to the shores of your trauma, you will always find yourself in places of despair. You will always find your place in places of depression, suicidal thoughts, pain, suffering, and hatred. You will always struggle to find your identity. You will always doubt who you are because you are tied to the shores of your trauma. And as long as you can see that land, you ain't gonna never be free. How do you, fasting and prayer. So y'all, this is the year. You can't tell me, if you don't fast and pray, then you don't wanna be free. You don't fast and pray this year. You don't cut something. You don't, you, you don't sacrifice something. Then you want to stay by the shores of your trauma. But you got to kill hate. Because for many of you, your self-hatred is causing your self-sabotage. You're devaluing yourself before anybody else can even value you. <laughs> so you attach a price to your forehead that says you're worth less than you are. So when you walk into the room, everybody sees the price you put on your forehead and they treat you as such. It's not that they devalued you. You labeled yourself as a has-been. You labeled yourself as a failure. You labeled yourself as unattractive. You labeled yourself as unhealthy. You labeled yourself as lonely and isolated and nobody's ever going to love me. You labeled yourself that. All everybody else did was read the price tag you put on yourself. Change the price tag. Change the price tag. And I get it. You put that price because daddy said something. You put that price because mama said You put that price because your boyfriend in sixth grade broke up with you and went to the dinner dance with your cousin. I, I, I get it. I get it. But you got to leave the shore to change your price. So I love you guys. We not no, no, no hoop and holler today. I need, you to, I need you to wrestle with this. I need you to sit with it. Ask yourself, uh, what do I hate? What do I actively devalue? And what caused me to do that? Some of you that your families are close and you and the 
the, the spouse and the kids. So, cause I know there are some families that sit and you all walk, walk through um, Sunday services together, ask each other, do I devalue you? And now y'all don't take this a whole nother screen. Parents don't, don't let the kids hustle you and be like, you know, dad, I think you devalue me cause you didn't give me a PlayStation 5. No fool that you failed gym. I'm not, and, and you at home now, I ain't even COVID, you ain't even in gym and you failed gym. So you don't get a PS5. You know, uh, don't let them hustle you in that sense, but have real conversation because you will find, watch this, that the price you put on yourself, you put a lower one on others around you. So kill the hate. Love you guys. Those of you that are able, please give, continue to give. Thank y'all so much. Uh, those of y'all checking in the boss, we don't really push giving a whole lot. We will teach on it biblically from now, uh, now and then. Um, every once in a while, we will say, hey, y'all give. Don't forget, be faithful in that. Uh, but we don't really we don't push it as much simply because I believe that you have to be faithful to what God has told you to do with your finances. That's between you and him. Um, we thank God for those of you that continue to give. You allow us to do so many things, give away groceries, pay people's bills here and there. Not not, 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 not here and there. Not all bills. So don't be hitting us up talking about my rent due here and there. Uh, you allow us to keep lights on. You allow us to do so many things that allow ministry to reach thousands of people. Um, and so we're grateful for what you give. Those of you that are able, do so. Those of you that are not able, don't feel bad. Uh, the Lord gives seed to the sower. Those of you that do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want you to hit us up, email us, let us know, hey, I want to accept Christ. Even if you want to be a part of this church, you can actually join through our e-campus. Just hit us up and we will tell you the steps you need to take to receive you to be part of this family. And so we love you guys. Kill this stuff. Kill it. And even if you ain't killed it this year, this moment, at least wounded, <laughs> at least, at least wounded. Y'all remember Harlem Nights? You remember Harlem Nights when they came, they was going after, uh, uh, what's the name? And they was, and then Arsenio Hall be like, pow. And then, pow. And he's like, don't you shoot that little thing no more. You remember that? Y'all remember that? At least be shooting a little gun. If you don't have the big one, at least have a little one to shoot it. All right. Love you. Kill hate. Kill this stuff. God bless y'all. See y'all next week. Peace.